move in five. Thank you all very much uh, for joining us from home. You're watching an interview with the Oxford Political Review, and we're incredibly honoured to be joined by Professor Nari Woods, the founding dean of the Blavatnik School of Government and professor of global economic governance at Oxford University. Thank you so much for joining us, Nairi. It's a privilege to have you here. It's a pleasure, Brian. So uh, I guess I'll just like to start off with a pretty big question, um, which is, is globalisation dead? Uh, no, I mean, globalisation is a process, um, not just of a world that's shrinking and, and distance being easier to overcome, but it's actually the product of a whole set of government choices about whether to open borders or to close them, whether to open capital markets or to close them, to open trade relations or to close them, to let people in or not. And as we've seen in the last two years over COVID, these are all decisions which are clearly within government's control. So a lot of people like to say globalization is a genie that's been let out of the bottle and you can't squash the bottle, the genie back into the bottle, but that's actually simply wrong. There is almost no part of globalization that governments and communities around the world cannot, if they want to, control. Now, that might be a great cost and they might decide they don't want to. But um, so globalization is with us and it's with us because governments are continuing to, to um, open borders in ways that make that possible. Yet we've also seen, I suppose, over the past decade, as you flagged, the increasing sense of nationalist angst and also anxieties about open borders, whether it be in, I guess, the backlash towards immigration in the EU, into the UK, or in general, perhaps the perception that globalisation has left more losers than winners, which is promulgating the sense of reactionary uh, insulation or isolationism you see in, I guess, Trumpism or underlying various forms of ideologies. And I think you're absolutely right that, you know, it's it's definitely a contingent circumstance or effect and extent. But would you say that there's a trend currently that pushes us towards or in the opposite direction from globalisation? Um, there's a lot in that question, Brian. And so let me just pull out two things, I think, that are in that question. And one is that globalization from the 1980s onwards was a very uneven process, that governments took choices, particularly the United States and European governments, took choices which opened new opportunities for business around the world. But what they didn't choose to do was to globalize responsibilities that went along with those opportunities. So we saw, we saw capital markets, trade, production um, create, you know, seize those opportunities across the world. But we saw those same companies, banks, financial services companies, et cetera, act abroad in an unregulated way. So, so the reason we've got to where we've got is because globalization of opportunities was not balanced with a globalization of responsibilities. Now, there's necessarily been a backlash to that as people associate globalization with the loss of good paying jobs, with zero hours contracts, with precariousness in employment, with a shortage of housing, a shortage of government services. You know, we've seen it both in, in Britain's vote um, to leave the European Union, an anti-globalization vote, and in the United States uh, continuing support for President Trump and his America First agenda. And that, in my view, is, um, is a very powerful backlash against what has been an unbalanced approach to globalization. So that's very interesting, in particular what you said about globalizing responsibility and globalizing opportunities. But I suppose the worry that we might have is that in a world where opportunities are sufficiently globalized, to so say where capital markets are sufficiently liberated, and also you've got access to all sorts of resources and travel and migration and whatnot that you previously didn't have, that would naturally also create sort of multiple poles or very dominant countries or powers or political systems whose tendencies or ideologies then cause sort of the, the very idea of equalization of responsibilities to be impossible because for, for them, they have their own self-interest. They want to project their own country's influence. They also want to compete against one another to an extent, which means that if you look at the world through a zero-sum game or the mentality that some of these countries have towards each other, 
that strikes that equalization responsibility is an ideal, but also an ideal that's perhaps futile in terms of actually being achieved in that sense. So are you asking me, Brian, um, are you saying that there are no governments? Uh, are you saying that some governments now want to stop globalization? And if that is what you're saying, which governments are you thinking of? So I'm thinking uh, along the lines of, I guess, firstly, not governments per se, but definitely people within states, right? Mm -hmm. So in many cases, they're reacting towards precisely the governments that they think are not, not responding to their anxieties or acts concerning globalization. Mm -hmm. So there's a claim about the people, and you see that in both, I guess, skepticism towards the EU, which has died down a bit within the European Union, mm -hmm. and also skepticism towards multilateral institutions and trade even in Southeast Asia, specifically, I'm thinking of the cases of Cambodia and Laos, where there's both a resentment towards Chinese investment and presence, but also an anxiety towards dumping and flooding of the markets by cheaper goods and whatnot. I don't necessarily think this translates to governmental or state-defined policies, mm -hmm. but it certainly is a dominant strand of thought, I suppose, that we mm -hmm. can see in the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's hard. So if you take a country like Cambodia, um, which has relied on picking up a whole sort of sector of garment factories and, um, you know, less skilled kind of work opportunities from global value chains. And you say, is that in Cambodia's interest? Well, under the Clinton administration, there was a huge effort to institute um, a trade agreement which required Cambodian companies, gov the government and foreign companies working in Cambodia to improve their labor rights and set um, in process that America's markets would be more open to Cambodia if they actually lived up to these improved labor rights. So when I talk about matching opening of opportunity with opening of responsibility, it's actually that kind of measure that helps us to understand how it is that you could actually do that. Because there is an argument that says that global value chains, that, that global trade does create employment in parts of the world that have had poverty. But it's also the case that we can all think of lots of examples where rather than creating employment, it's created an opportunity for some pretty egregious exploitation, which would not be permissible or acceptable in any of our own countries. But there is a middle way on that. And that middle way is, in my view, what international organizations and multilateral treaties should be there to do. They should be there to pick up on global responsibilities, on, on the issues that fall through the cracks if you leave individual governments just regulating within their own boundaries. Thank you. And I, I did want to ask you about the multilateral institutions um, that you've named just then. And, and there's, there's some who, who believe that with increasing friction or tensions in the bilateral relationship between US and China, that the bilateral relations there or the tensions there could pose an impediment to the multilateral institutions that we highlighted and discussed just then. Do you think this claim stands or do you think that's perhaps an overestimation of the importance of, yes, a significant but not necessarily the most important uh, relationship in international sort of trade and also politics? Well, look, there's a couple of things we can observe. One is that China has committed itself to wanting to be a member of each of those organizations, the World Trade Organization, the IMF, the World Bank, the World Health Organization, and all of the different UN specialized agencies. So China has said, we want to belong, we want to pay our dues, we want to be part of framing the rules in these institutions. Um, China's also become a much bigger economy and a much bigger competitor to the countries who for the last 75 years have had the habit of believing that these are their institutions to shape and, and control the rules of. So the United States is the only country with a veto power over special majority decisions in the IMF, in the World Bank, um, a veto power in the United Nations Security Council along with four other countries and with a very dominant position across the specialized agencies. For it and its allies, whether it's Australia or European allies, um, it's a shift in mindset to say, gosh, we should let this, as it were, young upstart have a place at our table, which has a little bit been the attitude over the last 20 years. And of course, China is not a young upstart. China, for most of the last thousand years, 
has been one of the world's largest economies and one of the most important economies. It's only the last 200 that have been different to that. And um, so, so for a lot of Chinese people, it, it, it should be more normal and acceptable that they have a seat at that top table and that they be part of making the rules of the global economy. But it does take a, a, a shift in mindset. Now, why should countries make that shift in mindset? Why should the United States and, and Europe and Australia and others say, okay, fair dues, you should also have a seat at the table and we should make rules with you rather than for you and impose them on you. And the reason is that there are some very serious issues, let me, let me name three, on which no country can protect its citizens unless there is cooperation between the United States, China, Europe, and the rest of the world. Controlling the pandemic is a very obvious one. Global financial stability in a world that went into COVID hugely indebted and is going to come out with a possible huge tsunami of debt crises is a second. And a third is climate change. Now, those three issues, no individual country can solve by saying, we're not going to listen to you, we're not going to talk to you, we don't like your political system. Though all three of those issues require global cooperation. And that's why the institutions are going to have to change, accommodate, and, and they have come some way to doing this already, but that's why they're going to have to change and accommodate. I think that's right. And I think you highlighted in particular the sort of self, or rather even from a purely self-interest centered point of view, there's every reason on the part of these countries, especially the national leaders to cooperate. I guess the worry I have personally is, it just strikes me that a lot of this is not communicated or necessarily accessed by the people on the ground, so even though multilateralism certainly makes sense from sort of an economic and game theory point of view. The, the sentiments that you see, even taking a very specific example here, so say America and the perception towards the China right now, there's a lot of, I would say, emotivist or sentimentalist rhetoric embodied in how people talk about China. They don't want anything to do with them, even in climate change or public health areas, because they don't allegedly trust China or they find China sort of rules betrayer and whatever the the narratives are that are popular for politicians or people to believe in there. And that discrepancy between rational interest and perceived interest strikes me as something that politicians and governments and multilateral institutions need to tackle. But they've arguably failed to do that. Do you think that's a fair assessment or do you think I'm too pessimistic here? No, I think that there are lots of reasons why people in different countries um, criticize their own, what happens in their own societies and what happens in other people's societies. And it's right that, that people should raise these issues, question them, stand up for the rights of others. All of that is coming from a well-intentioned place. The fact that you have those differences should not impede cooperation on genuine collective action goods. It cannot be that we should give up on any prospect of doing something about climate change because we disagree with each other's policies, whether it's on human rights or, or on energy consumption, or, or energy consumption is related, but on other issues, because these are not mutually exclusive areas. It's not by refusing to cooperate together on climate change that you change US policy towards incarceration or you change China's policy towards its its minorities. It's not by refusing to cooperate that you bring about change. On the contrary, if you can begin to cooperate on issues where you both see a mutual gain, it might be that cooperation helps you have an honest and humble dialogue about the things that in all countries you find difficult. You know, it strikes me that Australia and, and China would have a more constructive conversation if instead of um, throwing insults at one another. Um, the conversation began with, you know what, we've each got real problems with the way our minorities live. You know, the Aboriginal people have had 60 plus years of very, very difficult lives because of government policies um, and social policies. And likewise, there are minorities in China that are suffering hugely as a result of government. So, so let's Let's be honest, we have real challenges. So, you know, we could, we could 
share ideas about it, but let's engage in those conversations with some kind of humility. Because I, I actually think only then can you actually have any conversation at all. But if you start simply by insulting, blaming, finger pointing, all you do is create a siege mentality and enhance a sort of sense of nationalism. You know, I, I uh, one of my friends was was joking about, um, you know, the fact that all his friends who are students in China love Trump, and half of them love Trump because Trump's so good for Chinese nationalism, and the other half love Trump because Trump, you know, is critical of their leadership in a way that you know they they want to be. It, of course, there's different views, um, and I, I just think people. Um, shouldn't use one as, a, as an excuse not to cooperate on the other. Cooperation is difficult no matter what. But as I said, on the pandemic, on climate change, on financial stability, we can't do much unless we cooperate. And to cooperate on those issues is not to say that they are more important than other issues. It's just to say that they have a genuine collective action problem. Like those are issues on which you genuinely can't do anything unless you cooperate. Absolutely. And I think what you said about the need to sort of engage in constructive dialogue with humility is something that definitely resonates with my personal uh, worldview as well. But I wanted to, I guess, ask a question related to that in terms of Biden's China approach. Because I think when priorities are sent or priorities taking over the White House, there's a general observation that Biden sort of thinks and understands that there are certain problems like public global health and also climate change, et cetera, that requires precisely the multilateral sort of institutions and amicable working relationship in order to tackle. Yet, yet when he sort of entered office and if we look at the two months since then, he certainly pledged that he'd step up to leadership in climate governance and that he would bring put America back at the table. Yet a lot of the rhetoric there seems to espouse more of a sense of, ooh, it's an American unipolar system or America as the leading power, as opposed to one where I suppose it's more uh, egalitarian and multipolar, just as you said or described just then, one where there is indeed collaboration on equal footing between America and rising, if not equal powers. Uh, it just strikes me that that's not something that Biden's conveyed, despite the fact that he's repudiating sort of Trump's America first. It strikes me he's putting America first back in another form, in another shape. Uh, do you think that's a fair assessment of Biden or do you think that's perhaps giving too much credence to the isolationist tendencies in his rhetoric at times? Well, I, I think, frankly, it's a little early to judge the Biden administration. Uh, what I would say is that the last thousand years of world's history shows us how difficult it is when you've when um, when a country has been a leading power to accept a transition to either being primus inter pares or to being one of a group of countries. The West really never got this about Russia. They really didn't understand that, not for the Russian government, not for the Soviet government, but for normal people, for Russian people, who grew up in a system where they were told that they were citizens of a superpower country, right? With space exploration, with more gold medalists in the Olympics, that they were part of a superpower country. And overnight, they were expected to accept a status that suddenly they were supplicants on the edge of Europe, that suddenly their country was nothing, their country was a mess, their country was disregarded by others. When the Soviet Union collapsed and you know, Russia became, went back to being Russia. And I think there's a, there's a genuine, um, inability of people to understand the, the difficulty of that transition and why it is therefore that Putin's efforts to, to grab a new role on the stage in the Middle East, in Syria, in other places, to, to, to assert Russia's place at the table have actually had huge popular support. And in the same way in the United States, it's quite difficult for any president to say, you know, look at the trouble Jimmy Carter got into in the 1970s when he tried to kind of rewrite the rules and say, well, maybe America needs to be more humble or maybe we need to like come at this in a different way. Um, it's very difficult to, to tell a people that have been fed your number one in the world and, and we will set the rules for everybody else to step back and say, well, well, maybe, maybe we'll do it with others 
rather than for others. And given that difficulty, I suppose, I, I wanted to pick your brains and what do you think the prognosis then of sort of the US-China relationship would be over the next, say, five to 10 years? Because there's definitely a tension between the inevitable need to cooperate, uh, the fact that American sort of dominance and supremacy is just not an empirical fact that you can assert and take to be given. And then there's also people's unwillingness to, to recognize that, right? There's a sense that you know, this is causing a lot of cognitive dissonance and they just don't want to buy into that, that, that empirical trend. So, so what's your prognosis in general in that evolution, I suppose, of power dynamics? Look, I, I think the US and China need each other and will cooperate. And the trick will be to keep this out of the, the um, if the politicians leading in both countries can stop making it this the issue on which they try to rouse their public it's a lazy thing for a politician to do. It's a tempting thing for a politician to do, to say, let's all come together in our hatred of this other country. But it's an incredibly damaging thing to do. And I think both countries have a leadership that know that and know that, you know, and know how to step back. Now it's, and I'm, I'm relatively optimistic that if they can just take take this out of populist politics, because that doesn't actually help anybody. It doesn't, you know, Getting a community to hate another community has never in the world been something which produces a good outcome or better outcomes for anybody. So in my view, once you step back from that populist kind of saber rattling, you give each other space to shape the narrative in a different way. The more the United States has criticized China over coronavirus, the more the Chinese rhetoric has become nationalist and triumphalist. We're the only ones that got it right. We, you know, we've managed it well. We've had so few deaths. Look at the United States. And then the more they've done that, the more the United States have blamed them for being the source. So it's a really unconstructive debate because I would say to you, that's not saving a single life, that kind of debate. What it is doing is making cooperation even more difficult. So lower the temperature on the political. Um, debate and get on with the real cooperation, which I think we are going to see. I think we need China and the United States to agree, for example, to do an SDR allocation in the IMF. It sounds very technical, but it's a way to increase liquidity in the system. And then they're both going to need to agree to adopt, adapt the rules so as to allocate, reallocate that, that, that liquidity to the poorest countries so that they can afford to buy vaccines. Both America and China need to do that because both of them depend upon movements of goods, commodities, natural resources, and people from poor countries in the world. And if those poor countries cannot vaccinate, cannot vaccinate first their front line of nurses and doctors to protect them, and then more broadly, the population, then China and the United States are going to have to keep borders closed. And they can't afford that. They're both open economies. So there's a, there's a mutual interest in this kind of cooperation. And I think we've, we've, we're already seeing it. We're seeing China and the United States cooperate on, for example, suspending debt to the poorest countries. It's a, look, there'll be lots of people that line up to say it's too little, it's too late, it's not enough, it's not enough countries, it's not enough debt suspension, it's only suspension, it's not relief. All of that is completely true, but it's an important first step because it shows that China, the United States and Europe and others can cooperate when they set their minds to it. They can cooperate on the on global finance and development assistance. They can cooperate on vaccines and on solving this global health crisis, even as they compete for who's got the best vaccine, for which countries buy their vaccine. That's fine. That cooperate, that competition is fine. But alongside it, we need we need cooperation. And, and just to pick up on one thing you said, Nairi, actually, which I thought was very interesting, you talked about the need to lower the temperature and to step away from populism. I certainly am no fan of populism, although I guess the logistical question then becomes, given the way the democratic structures in America, so as I'm saying China side, but in the US is shaped such that in many cases, it's about those who can pay for the loudest, angriest and most vocal ads, or those who can essentially gain the support or the recognition of the largest number of folks in a few critical swing states. 
populism, unfortunately, does strike me to be still a potent force, even despite uh, the downfall of Trump or the temporary respite from Trump. Uh, and it, it also begs the question then of what can politicians do to dissolve, to tackle, to reduce populism in their countries? Mm -hmm. So when I said step away from populism, I meant to say step away from populist uses of this hatred of the other country, mm -hmm. right? Now, you, you pose a broader question now about populism. To me, populism is the result of politicians to the direct link from people to the politician. And if you think about it over the last few hundred years, most societies have derived ways to get beyond that direct link. So we have representative politicians rather than direct democracy, you know, where, where everybody votes on every issue. And there's a very good reason for that, because most of us don't want to have a long day at work and then go home and look over the business plan for a new bridge and decide, should it be built in this place or that place? You know, direct democracy would be exhausting for us in the modern world to, to try to have an informed view of every decision. Um, and so we, we have elected democracy where we elect people to serve the public interest, relying on the fact that they will take expertise from people who really do do their homework and adjudicate what is best in the public interest and then make decisions based on that information and we can then adjudicate whether we think they're doing a good job and vote them in or vote them out. And that is modern representative democracy. Now, what we're seeing is politicians called populists starting to short circuit that and say, ah, you know, why should we bother about the elected democracy bit? Like, I don't want to listen to experts and nor do I particularly want to listen to elections. I want a direct link to my populace. I want a direct link. I want people to be able to just stand in a crowd and tell me what to do or tell me what they like or tell me that I can do anything I like without restraint. And that in history has a terrible set of outcomes because power needs constraints. No matter who's in power, they need constraints because power otherwise creates an incentive for people and the people around the powerful to do worse and worse things to stay clinging to power. So, so populism, um, on the one hand is something that we need we need to resist the call that po some populists make to dismantle our institutions right to stop having restraints on police power to use parliaments to use all of our institutions probably because those institutions might seem bothersome but they're in in there for a good place but let me say and i i i really think this second point is very important about populism the rise of populism should not be disdained and disregarded. The rise of populism should be an absolute clarion call to what is failing in representative democracy. And there's three things that strike me that populists do that we should be watching and heeding and understanding as a critique of representative democracy. And the first thing is the populist claim, I'm on your side, is one that resonates because so many people, after a few decades of globalization, as we were saying, feel that their lives are precarious, their children have even less chance than they had, that a, a good education is, is not something they can access anymore, decent housing, a stable job, a non-precarious income, that in that world, they feel that the elite are just feathering the nests for themselves. And so the first thing populists do, often um, in a disingenuous way and often without genuine purpose, is to say, I'm on your side. I'm on your, you're, you're disaffected, you're angry, you're mad, you're furious. I'm on your side. I feel your pain. I feel your anger. I'm going to be angry on your behalf. So that's lesson one. And lesson one for representative democracies is politicians have to be connected to the people who are feeling angry and marginalized. They have to listen, understand, and speak to those people. Lesson two is the populist messages are simple. You know, make America great. You know, take back control. And there's no reason why representative democracies cannot use simple messaging. It's not simple to use simple messaging. It's actually really difficult. It takes time and effort to take complex messages and make them simple and intuitively understandable to people. And the third thing that, that populists do is 
I like Oakshot's uh, comment that politics goes from long periods of pragmatism to periods of transformation. And we are now in a transformative period after a, about three decades of quite pragmatic politics where it was enough for politicians to say, you know, I, I will increase GDP by a bit. I'll make our public services a little more efficient. You know, I'll attract a little more investment. The world we live in today has people yearning for a much more transformative message. I will transform your lives. It's almost um, a religious message of redemption and transformation that people yearn for. And it's those messages that are showing cut through in surveys around the world. And that, and again, representative in representative democracies, people need to listen to that and think about what is the transformation that's required and what's the transformative message they can go out and offer to people who are so disaffected with, with what they currently have. Th thank you for those thoughts. And those definitely highlights, I think, a directionality that democracy and democratic or non-democratic politics could take in regaining both, I guess, a sense of trust and also buying from the people, but also a wider sense of perceived legitimacy. I suppose my, my worry there is just when it comes to nationalistic ideologies, they tend to meet the criteria that you outlined just then more than the opposite to it. So it's easier to sell that I'm on your side when you say I'm only on our side as opposed to all of our sides, or that it's easier to characterize or explain why you owe a duty towards your state because it's simple. You're, in, you're my countrymen. You look like me. That's why uh, we believe in the same things. Yeah. And finally, I suppose the transformative potential of uh, politics is something that's quite uh, flamboyantly carried by a lot of nationalistic ideologies. If we look at post-independence uh, African states as well and sort of strong sense of anti-colonial, post-colonial nationalism that undergirds them. So in order for us, I suppose, who are anti-nationalists or believe in nationalism, but not to the point of being overwhelmingly, I guess, exuberant, we need to find ways to combat that. And I suppose that's, I guess, a tricky question. Well, I think, so I certainly wouldn't say I'm anti-nationalist. It's that what I'm for is an inclusive form of nationalism that says you are part of my community. Yes, you look different, you speak a different language, you might worship a different God, whatever, but you are part of my community. We are community together. And one of the things we learned from the period of decolonization was that very different communities came together to fight a common enemy, you know, the, the colonial power that they were trying to get rid of. And the countries that did best subsequently were the countries that managed to create an inclusive nationalism that said, we are all Indians or we are all Tanzanians. You know, we will stand together to build this country for all of us. And so... To me, it's not whether you're anti-nationalist or pro-nationalist. It's about what kind of nationalism you're appealing to. That's very fair. And for the last question today, uh, thank you so much, Nairi. Uh, I was just wondering, as someone who's worked straddles policy, practice, and also academia, for those who aspire to sort of take upon or embark upon a similar career, would you have any thoughts or advice for uh, basically... Uh, individuals with such passions or, or have such endeavors in their lives? Oh boy, I couldn't presume. You know, all I would say is keep keep your eyes up. Like don't keep your eyes on the ladder. Don't keep your eyes on your next step. Keep your eyes up. Think big. Think about the big goals that you want. Be bold in thinking about that. And the more you prepare yourself for those big goals, then the more you'll be able to seize opportunities which actually excitingly take you towards those big goals. So, you know, be bold and then work hard and with a lot of positive hope. My, my, main, my main rule is work on positive things. It's so easy to sit by and criticize. It's so easy to protest and veto and cancel and to stop things happening. And sometimes it's really important to do that. But all I would say is at some point you've got to decide, do I want my life to be one where I actually make a positive difference or do I want my life to be one where I'm calling out other people's bad behavior? And I, I would urge you all to give thought, if you're a person of energy and intelligence and talent, 
give thought to making a positive difference because you really have the capability to do that. It just takes focusing on it and sharing a positive energy with your colleagues and with your organizations and with the with the way that you engage with life. Um, that's, I guess, what I would urge you. Thank you so much for, for the answer and also in general for joining us today. It was our pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you all for watching from home. Uh, you've been watching the Opsa Political Review and I'm the Editor-in-Chief, Brian Wong, and we've just heard from uh, Professor Nairwood. So thank you very much. <laughs>